Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, webinar on climate change and commercial arbitration. Let's start with further ado. I would like to pre present Kevin O'Gorman. He's the head of the of arbitration and U.S. partner in charge of the Houston office of Norton Rose Fulbright, specializing in energy, international investor state, and maritime disputes. And ex he's an expert in dispute resolution um, and, and very well known. Um, uh, Kevin, I'll hand over the floor to you. Please go ahead. Terrific. Thank you so much, Herfried. And it's my pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, I'll be speaking on uh, the role of international adjudication and arbitration uh, in the of historic mass claims to set the stage. Uh, Natalie Allen uh, will then follow me, uh, and her topic will be why international commercial arbitration is perhaps not, not the best vehicle uh, for climate change related disputes. Um, which which she uh, will will argue arguendo that doesn't necessarily mean that's what she believes. Uh, and third will be Patrick Tifri, uh, who will talk about possible adaptations of commercial arbitration for climate dispute resolution. Uh, and then after that, we'll be happy uh, to hear your questions. Uh, so to to kick things off, um, let's talk about when we refer to climate change disputes. Uh, what are we referring to? Uh, and uh, we have the ICC task force on resolving climate change disputes through arbitration and ADR that was issued in 2019, a very fulsome report, a groundbreaking report. I'm happy to report that Patrick here with us today was the co-chair of that groundbreaking initiative. And I might add, I was a US delegate. Uh, and the task force adopted a very broad definition of what constitutes climate change disputes. Uh, and I think that will be useful for introducing and really framing what we're talking about uh, here today. And so the ICC task force uh, came up with three prongs of what could constitute a climate change dispute for the purpose of, of these discussions. Uh, the first are contract disputes relating to the implementation of energy transmission, transition, mitigation, or ad adaptation in line with the Paris Agreement commitments, uh, which have now been incorporated into some domestic regulations and law. Uh, the second broader prong are contract disputes without any specific climate change related purpose or subject matter, but where a dispute involves or gives rise to climate or related environmental issues. We all know that with the energy transition, there will be required literally trillions of dollars of investment uh, in renewables, uh, renewable and for the transition. Uh, and this prong uh, encapsulates disputes that arise out of that investment that's necessary uh, for the transition. Uh, and the third and perhaps uh, more most interesting category of, of potential climate change disputes are, are non-contractual disputes uh, involving states or private parties regarding climate change or related environmental disputes involving, for instance, um, impacted groups or populations uh, due to climate change. So that is a way to frame what constitutes climate, uh, climate change disputes for the purposes of our discussion today. And the speakers and I might be coming back to some of those definitions and touching on those uh, as we go forward. Uh, the next question is, um, getting to the historical basis, is what are some examples of historical arbitration tribunals that resolved mass claims, and what can they teach us about the utility of arbitration for climate change-related disputes? Uh, and I would suggest uh, to look forward, we should first look back. Uh, and what can we learn from historic arbitration and mass claims tribunals and how could this impact resolution of climate disputes? Of course, we all know that arbitration can be a, fle a flexible and adaptable method of dispute resolution. Uh, and I will share with you today some of the rich history that arbitration has in the mass claims context. Of course, there have been many, many ad hoc tribunals over the years, but let me start with a few examples. Uh, first, the 1794 
J Treaty, imagined by none other than Alexander Hamilton and negotiated on the United States side by John Jay. Uh, the Jay Treaty created a commission to settle claims, uh, three different types of claims. One, boundary disputes between the United States and Great Britain uh, after the Revolutionary War. Uh, two, claims for pre-revolutionary war debts by English providers of services. Uh, and three, the English seizure uh, of hundreds of merchant vessels belonging to the United States. Uh, the commission ultimately uh, issued hundreds of awards uh, in its service. And um, notably, uh, the parties complied with those awards. And you can say that the Jay Treaty and the Jay Tribunals uh, were really the beginning of the modern era of international commercial arbitration. Let's fast forward now to the modern era. The Iran-US Claims Tribunal, uh, it is dealing with claims related to the 1979 Islamic Revolution in Iran and was established by an exchange of diplomatic notes uh, through Algeria between Iran and the United States, referred to as the Algiers Accords. This tribunal has been deciding both individual uh, and corporate claims, as well as critically state-to-state -state claims between the United States and Iran arising out of the revolution. By 2005, uh, this tribunal has uh, achieved the peaceful re resolution and decision in almost 3,000 claims with more than 3 billion US dollars awarded uh, to both Iranian and United States parties. Now, the, tri the tribunal continues to this day. It was founded in 1981 and still continues, currently dealing with a number of very, very large state-to-state -state claims. What's another example of how arbitration can work? And I refer you to the United Nations Compensation Commission, uh, which was established by the United, States, United Nations Security Council to address claims relating to uh, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in the 1990 Gulf War that, that culminated in the Gulf War. This has been the largest war repar reparations tribunal in history. It was established in 1991, uh, largely complete now. And if you can imagine the success of this tribunal, of this compensation commission, it addressed more than 2.7 million claims and awarded over $19 billion. Another example of how arbitration can be used in a mass claims context uh, is one I'm very familiar with, which is the Claims Resolution Tribunal for Dormant Accounts in Switzerland. This was created uh, by the Swiss Bankers Association and the World Jewish Congress to adjudicate claims to the Holocaust era dormant bank accounts in Switzerland, typically uh, relating to claims by Holocaust victims who were encouraged to make deposits in the 1930s uh, and then were not uh, recognized after the war, either them or their, their relatives. And the Swiss banks uh, maintained all the money until this tribunal was established. The tribunal was chaired by Paul Volcker, who enlisted the leading international arbitration um, experts of the day. Uh, and ultimately, the tribunal addressed over 10,000 claims uh, and awarded over $1.2 billion. Now, there's been extensive academic study and practical study of these institutions that I've mentioned and how they've worked and what did not work. For example, why is the United States Iran claims tribunal still going after all these years? And is that a good thing? Fortunately, we have, as I mentioned, great uh, academic and expert commentary on these tribunals. And the Permanent Court of Arbitration actually has a steering committee on mass claims processes. Uh, the PCA is a repository for information concerning these mass claims tribunals and processes and provides a source of information for those involved in existing mass claims tribunals, as well as those responsible for the design of future ones. So as we look to the present and future of the resolution of climate change disputes, the question is, what can we learn from these past specialized tribunals? Let me go on now and shift gears to kind of a related topic, which is 
what would be some of the key benefits in establishing a bespoke arbitral process for climate disputes. Now, you'll hear about the utility or not uh, of established and existing international arbitration institutions from both Natalie and Patrick. But what could a specialized bespoke tribunal bring to climate disputes, such as those, uh, those claims by impacted groups and populations the third category of climate change I mentioned uh, at the top of the program. Uh, in addition to fairness and impartiality, what could be some of the benefits that could be baked into a specialized tribunal? Certainly, you would want it to be accessible at reasonable or no cost to claimants and efficient. Costs, of course, can have a chilling effect. For example, the Claims Resolution Tribunal for Dormant Accounts in Switzerland and its arbitrators uh, by agreement between the Swiss Bankers Association and the World Jewish Congress was funded entirely by the banks. Uh, and that's both the costs of the tribunal, the costs of the secretariat, the costs of the arbitrators. The claimants were not required to pay any fees uh, to bring their claims. A, a second aspect that would be very important in establishing a tribunal and could really drive such a tribunal is that you could create a tribunal with uh, fantastic expertise of the decision makers with relevant experience, including for climate change disputes, scientific and technical expertise to ensure a correct and reliable decisions uh, in this very fast changing field. Of course, creating such a tribunal, you would want a procedure conducive to resolution of these climate change disputes. Uh, Natalie will talk about transparency, but of course, uh, that would be an issue that would want to be covered uh, when you would establish a tribunal. You balance transparency. Of course, there's very important issues of public policy and state involvement versus the traditional approach of arbitration involving confidentiality. I would, I would suggest that transparency would be more important than confidentiality for this type of tribunal. Uh, additionally, third-party involvement, amicus curiae and other stakeholders might well want to have a role in the resolution of these disputes before a specialized tribunal. Uh, and creating the, the tribunal and the rules would need to balance uh, and, and recognize uh, the important role of third parties. Uh, and finally, uh, enforceability, of course, is very key. And as I mentioned, the, the J Treaty uh, the awards were complied with at the end of the day. Um, and if, if the uh, specialized tribunal were created uh, in the arbitration framework, you would have uh, the New York Convention uh, available for the enforcement of, of any awards issued by, by that tribunal. Now, let me turn to my last topic, which are some of the key challenges uh, in establishing an arbitration forum for climate disputes. Perhaps the most difficult uh, would be achieving consent of both the claimants and the respondents to participate in an arbitration type forum. Of course, even in traditional commercial arbitration, it's very difficult to achieve a submission agreement to arbitration if the parties had not agreed to arbitration uh, before their disputes arose. Uh, and that, of course, those issues would be magnified uh, in the climate uh, change dispute category. A another impediment is the lack of clearly established private rights and responsibilities in the chi climate change context. Currently, there are thousands of climate change cases working their way through the courts under a variety of legal theories at play. These disputes can involve claims against sovereigns regarding the pace of of climate change uh, measures, such as the Urgenda case versus the Netherlands. There's even a case against the state of Montana uh, regarding the constitutional right for a clean environment. There are shareholders claims. There are direct private claims. And you can imagine everything is being tried these days, negligence, tort, fraud, fraudulent concealment, nuisance. Uh, uh, one of these uh, largest claims uh, currently in the United States is against the is brought by the city of Honolulu against a number of energy companies, and that is set for trial 
uh, this year and will be very interesting to watch. There are claims of agency and alter ego. There are claims under conventions such as the European Convention on Human Rights. There are investor state claims. There are regulatory claims. But once, because of the, the vast diversity of the types of claims and the types of rights involved, that will be another impediment in achieving consensus for any type of um, international tribunal to go forward. Now, as those claims get adjudicated and 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 more and better understood, that could, of course, facilitate a, agreement uh, for one global tribunal. But the fundamental question is for both claimants and respondents: is why would arbitration be any better or more favorable than the courts? That's where the cases are pending now. Uh, and I would su suggest to you that as a model of the claims resolution tribunal regarding the dormant accounts, uh, that system worked extremely well. Uh, it was a very, uh, it was a fast proceeding at no cost to the claimants, uh, and it effectively ended uh, the local uh, litigation involving those claims. In other words, both the claimants and the defendants uh, decided and realized that adjudicating these claims in one expedited forum would be more favorable for both of them, uh, and that's how it worked. Uh, in the final analysis, uh, there is much to commend the use of international arbitration to resolve mass disputes, and we can learn from past successes and otherwise in dealing with whether to establish such tribunals for climate change disputes. And now it's my pleasure to hand the floor over to Natalie. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so as Kevin alluded to, um, I have confessed to my co-panelists that I am very passionate uh, and excited about arbitration. And I know that some of you attending today are colleagues or former colleagues, so will have also experienced that enthusiasm firsthand. So I thought today um, I would challenge myself by um, trying to work out whether international arbitration does really work for climate change uh, related claims. And so in, in addressing that issue, I sort of set myself five questions that I wanted to go through with you today, which is what are the potential alternative fora to international arbitration for climate change related disputes? So what is out there? What is available? Um, and as Kevin alluded to, how important is transparency in relation to climate change related disputes? Uh, significantly, what is the impact um, or, or the value of the threat of negative PR or public relations issues for a lot of the companies that would be involved in these claims? Also, how is significant is the ability to appeal, um, which is not necessarily available easily in arbitration? And is it really necessary for non-contractual parties to have an avenue for bringing claims? So looking at the first question, um, what are the potential alternative dispute for, uh, for inter alternatives to international arbitration for climate related claims? I think if we adopt um, a wide interpretation of this um, and, and try and put some legal um, expectations to one side for a second. There are a number of different procedures um, and fora available for dealing with climate change issues. So, for example, we see at the moment an increase in the use of complaints procedures. Just recently, there was the announcement that Virgin and BA, uh, British Airways, have been on the recipient receiving end of OECD complaints. And these aren't binding, the determinations are not binding, but they can be very impactful. Um, and you know, we've previously seen BP being on the receiving end of one of those from Client Earth. And in fact, in that case, um, the outcome was that BP amended its advertising campaign. So it was not a claim in the strictest sense, but it was um, a, a method or a development that enabled or enabled Client Earth to secure change from BP. Um, we will see what happens with regards to Virgin and British Airways. Um, we also see an increase in um, advertising complaint, complaints to advertising regulatory bodies. This is in particular in relation to greenwashing. Um, and you know, we've seen, for example, recently or in the last year or so, the HSBC um, complaint in the UK where um, HSBC was criticized um, for an advertising campaign that featured sustainability, but with no mention of its fossil fuel investments. And so the outcome of that is to hold HSBC to um, a higher standard than the one it was holding itself to. We've also seen um, the outcome of regulatory investigations. So for example, DWS, uh, 
and its parent Deutsche Bank, where um, they were DWS was fined by the SEC, uh, I think it was $25 million as a result of um, allegations of greenwashing allegations followed by a whistleblower. Um, so we have seen a, a number of different avenues for bringing about change. Um, and I think it's important to bear in mind that those are designed to bring about change. We've also seen a number of non-contractual claims in different domestic courts, and these have been talked about a lot. Again, these are designed to bring about change. So Milieu de Fancy and Shell on the back of agenda in the Netherlands is, is well known, well documented, well discussed. Um, Client Earth and Shell, Shell's name will come up a number of times uh, in my presentation today, um, but Client Earth and Shell um, was you know, a case that was cl closely followed, um, unsuccessful for Client Earth, but I'm not sure we've seen the last of the types of attempts to force directors to take their, their duties, to take climate change uh, into consideration with regards to their directors' duties. We're also closely watching um, Lua and RWE in the German courts where um, damages are being sought for uh, reparation work arising from flooding of um, a lake in Peru due to RWE's alleged con contributions to climate change. I think that will be a very interesting case to watch as it will contribute towards setting um, the tone for causation. And then more recently, and one that um, does excite me very much, is the California and ExxonMobil and other fossil fuel companies um, with claims based on allegations of misleading the public, despite uh, knowing, um, allegedly knowing about the, the effects of climate, the climate change effects of fossil fuels since the 1950s. So I think we, it is clear that there are alternatives to international arbitration um, and that most of those are non-contractual parties and designed to bring about change. So then if we take a closer look at the importance of transparency, because these proceedings are generally speaking public, um, analysed and much discussed by the legal community and others. So how important is transparency in relation to climate change related claims? And here it seems to me that it depends which side of the fence you are sitting on. For, uh, for these activist disputes, um, transparency is key. There is a, there is a pressure point, um, there is a need to have these discussed in the public domain. And in fact, the IBA um, uh, ESG subcommittee recently issued a report on ESG claims. And in a survey that was conducted for this report, um, a lot of the participants who I understand to be mostly companies said that transparency was very, very important. They also said confidentiality was very, very important. And I, I'm sure that Patrick will touch on this. And it is difficult to see how those two sit together. It, interestingly, um, I think that this is a tension that is reflected in some of the surveys that are conducted by users of arbitration, particularly the Queen Mary survey, where confidentiality and transparency both come out as being very important. Um, and I think it's, it's a slightly unresolved tension um, in the context of international arbitration. But why is transparency key? Well, transparency is key because it's, it's necessary for the learning and the open evolution of climate change related claims. They enable um, stakeholders to understand how these claims are developing, the legal standards, the proof, the damages, how the science is being used and, um, and, and how causation is or is not being established. It enables us to understand what claims are successful and why and which claims are unsuccessful and why. Um, which in inevitably informs our own practice and our own approach. It also enables us to analyze more openly how compensation or remedies are being articulated and established. So to me, transparency is imperative for the learning of how these claims are being brought and how they're being used, but also with a practitioner's hat on, how to avoid those claims and how to enable companies to understand what the pitfalls may or may not be. As I mentioned, um, the IBA subcommittee report really reflected uh, or revealed a real fear of negative PR. Um, and so what is the value of that threat of negative PR? It's, it's clearly very concrete for many companies and not just in the sectors that we would expect. It, it is wide ranging. Um, and this is in part because companies are experiencing more and more ESG related obligations, both regulatory obligations, but also contractual commitments. And there is much more of a focus on this area. So for them, it, it's imp important. And obviously, um, arbitration as a confidential process becomes a lot more appealing. And, and I understand that. And I think that the report reflects that. 
So it's clearly that th this threat of PR or negative PR is clearly on the minds of corporates. Um, to me, it's not entirely clear that, that, is, that there is genuine reputational damage or that there is always damage or even that where there is damage, that that damage is that long term. I think if we look at some of the greenwashing claims, for example, that we've seen, it's not clear to me that there is a direct impact beyond a fine or, or being told off. So in, in the UK, we've seen, or in Europe, we've seen H&M, the clothing company, um, being criticised for um, a misleading a misleading line of clothing, um, and they had to make a contribution to a charity. Um, we've seen Oatly, that produces the oat milk, also um, being criticised. I'm not sure that they have suffered that much for that criticism. And HSBC, which I referred to before. But we've also seen the DWS and Deutsche Bank, which in addition to a hefty fine from the SEC, also saw a 13% drop in share price, which is difficult to come back from crawl back um, and as a result this process exposed other problematic areas in the business and contributed to the CEO stepping down so that threat or that impact is real but it is not clear to me that it is always a significant impact for companies and then I turn to look at well, how important is the ability to appeal precisely because that is largely unavailable in arbitration and is sometimes sold as one of the advantages of international commercial arbitration. So how important is the ability to appeal? So if you are found, if your company is found to have um, breached climate change obligations and it's known publicly, so it's sort of in the domestic courts, um, the ability to still be able to clear your name and to show that you have fought till the end is very important. On the flip side, if you lose your appeal, um, that can make things worse and not just from a cost perspective. Um, but similarly, if a, if a company is found not to be in breach, the threat of appeal can be very burdensome. So we saw recently again with the Client Earth and Shell, where Client Earth kept appealing uh, the decision not to allow the dispute to or the claims to go through. And that meant that this was a subject that was very much alive and discussed quite widely um, in, in a number of different communities. And so the, pub the public nature that goes alongside an appeal can be a plus and it can be a minus. Um, Again, I personally feel that the appeal mechanism can be a very useful for, for, from a learning perspective. So in England, we saw um, Occupy and Shell, which went up to the Supreme Court, the UK Supreme Court, which established that in theory, um, a parent company can be liable for the actions of its subsidiary. And because it's been tested by the UK Supreme Court, it's been analysed and that this helpfully sets out a clear standard of potential parental liability that I know from speaking to clients is very useful to them in understanding the scope of their potential obligations and vulnerability to these types of disputes. And because this issue, this was an issue that was debated at several levels in um, the UK process, there has been real analysis that has come out as a result of the appeal process. Arbitration doesn't allow for that discussion in the same way. And then lastly, is it really necessary for non-contractual parties to have an avenue for bringing claims? Well, if you're looking at things from an activist perspective, then absolutely, it is unquestionably um, imperative. We've seen this with Milieu de Fancy and Shell, California and ExxonMobil were seeing it, and you were an RWE. These claims would not be possible if they were, if they were limited to contractual obligations. But it seems to me that actually these for an, the, the litigation is not necessarily applicable or necessary in all circumstances relating to the climate change fight again, um, particularly when we consider the evolving contractual and regulatory landscape. To me, and this is what I see in practice, entities to ne need to be able to work out somewhat in private what commitments do and don't work, how they can be implemented, and they need to be able to do that without the fear of extensive public scrutiny. Um, because otherwise, you, you run the risk of something similar akin to green hushing, which is an effect where people don't engage with the climate change commitments for fear of being criticized for what they have done or being um, attacked for what they have done. We need to have a relatively private space within which companies can understand what they can and can't do and how. 
So to me, it seems that litigation has a pivotal role to play in activism against climate change. It allows NGOs, citizens, activists to bring claims aimed at compelling change, and that change can sometimes be necessary. But arbitration allows for the commercial realities of climate change commitments to be addressed more privately and without the risk of becoming involved in a very political agenda. So inevitably, I have found a way for arbitration to continue and win in some respects, and I have hopefully paved the way for Patrick to fly the flag for arbitration. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you both your presentations were very uh, impressive and it's very challenging to uh, to come after that. Thank you very much, uh, first of all, to Herfried Voss for uh, this beautiful invitation and to Nivalian. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here, although uh, I'd rather be uh, in London, in uh, Houston or in uh, Mexico than in uh, rainy Paris today. But we are supposed not to be traveling so much anymore, so we'll uh, we'll take a Zoom instead. Um, so I, I was supposed I, I was going to um, investigate the uh, possible uh, changes on improvements, changes uh, we'll see to arbitration in order to better uh, to provide a better response to climate change related disputes. Um, this leads me to start from the, uh, the report that Kevin mentioned of the uh, ICC uh, Task Force on Arbitration of uh, Climate Change Related Disputes, which was issued in late uh, 2019, uh, and which uh, and, and to wonder what has changed since then. I'm not going to tell you what's in the report, that's, uh, that's all the history. Has, have things changed? Uh, the report at the time, uh, in, an, in, in a couple of sentences, uh, concluded that arbitration was not a, the primary forum for public interest disputes resolution. Of course, you've heard that right now, but that it still has some advantages. Uh, let me not detail them, but say that the flexibility uh, 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 is a lot for it. Uh, sometimes arbitration may even provide better responses when you have a multiplicity of parties, when you have a diversity of jurisdictions, and you want to consolidate the dispute, which may make sense. You have complex cross-border issues, you have enforcement considerations. Arbitration enjoys the benefit of the New York Convention, which is uh, really an all countries uh, visa for arbitral awards. Uh, and then already in 2019, the report, and I think that's interesting to start from there, concluded that there might be some uh, social acceptability considerations uh, for the prospects uh, for uh, arbitration of uh, climate-related disputes. And when we hear uh, uh, developments from, uh, from Natalie and from Kevin about transparency, about uh, um, mass arbitration, we, we're clearly already in this uh, social acceptability uh, line of questioning. What has changed in 2019, I think, is, is two things, uh, two, two, is, is developments that uh, are not intrinsically related to arbitration uh, and perhaps not even to climate disputes, but to some extent, yes. The first very remarkable uh, thing uh, is the development of a new uh, legislative strategy for, for, for countries, uh, for various countries in the world, uh, which is very well illustrated in the uh, European Green Deal, but which you can find also in, uh, in uh, proposals pending before the Securities Exchange and Exchange Commission in the US, or which have already given rise to legislation in Switzerland, for example. And that is what I will summarize as uh, the sustainable finance strategy, which relies upon uh, corporate governance to uh, implement ESGs, environmental social governance uh, targets, goals uh, in the better. And in the nutshell, this is, this is a, the name and shame story. This is transparency, but this is required transparency. This is the extension of uh, regular uh, disclosure requirements uh, that exist for companies, 
both large companies and, 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 and financial market operators to disclose uh, their impacts. Now, what has to be realized is this is not something that is specific to Europe or that is tentative in the US but will not work because of the political uh, climate or whatever. Uh, no, that is being developed at the level of the G20, the, the, the group of the 20 largest nations. The G20 has a financial stability board, which has uh, instituted a, a task force on uh, climate uh, disclosures. In, in a word, it requires large and financial companies to disclose both the impacts of climate change on their activities and their assets and liabilities, and that's that's the outside in uh, uh, impact and the inside out impact, the impacts of the company's activities or investments or, 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 or choices on climate and on other ESG considerations. That's the principle of double materiality. It goes both ways. What do I do to the climate? What does the climate uh, put at risk in on my uh, balance sheet? Now, this is legal requirements because it all takes place in the existing uh, 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 corporate law, company laws, or, 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 or um, um, uh, securities laws of the various countries. And it is progressing. As I told you, Switzerland has it as hard law. The EU has it in the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, the Sustainable Finance uh, Disclosure Regulation, the Taxonomy Regulation, and, and soon in the uh, Corporate Sustainability uh, the, um, Due Diligence Directive, I mean, which is coming. Uh, so it's all it's all there, and that changes a lot. Uh, that's the first trend. The second trend is the development of human rights in the climate and environmental scene, uh, and we see uh, an increase of um, the uh, use of uh, human rights uh, legal basis, both in litigation against the states, uh, government, you're not doing enough to protect us and our and our next generations, and against the private sector, um, largely based on the United Nations uh, guiding principles on business and human rights, but those are very important. You're, you're going to see why in a second, because they provide that uh, states must see to it that business respects human rights, uh, that therefore, impliedly, even though they are not bound by international public law, businesses, companies must respect human rights. And to securize that, to, 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 to enforce that, they have to offer state and non-state grievance mechanisms, arguably non-litigious, and access to justice. But it might be private justice too. Therefore, it might be arbitration. Just a very good illustration on that is the uh, 2021 uh, judgment from a, a court in The Hague in the Royal Dutch Shell case. Uh, and I'm not saying that the Hague Court was right. I'm saying it is interesting that it has reasoned like this. It has reasoned that because there are United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights that require, as a matter of fact, uh, business to, rest, to comply with human rights and to guarantee that there will be state and non-state grievance mechanisms and access to justice, they have to do it. And therefore, Royal Dutch Shell was held liable under a regular tort liability legal basis, held liable to decrease its emissions, the emissions of its suppliers, subsidiaries everywhere in the world, and its customers to decrease their emissions by 45%, uh, which is not a little thing, uh, whatever the details are. And But the thing is that the reasoning is here. And once the reasoning is here, you will find it in many countries, in many different courts, argued by many different parties against many different types of uh, defendants or respondents. And that is bound to give rise to a new set of disputes and of disputes that naturally should come up with mass claim aspects. 
And this is where I connect with Kevin's presentation. What Kevin has told us is that this is feasible, is that the category three claims of the ICC task force report, the, the what we call the bespoke agreements, where in fact we would have invitation to arbitrate, like in bilateral investment treaties, but in corporate charters, in, in, in many types of documents where companies would say, and we had a very important uh, major inference that said, I don't want to be sued in 20, 50, 100 different countries on this type of problems. Let's consolidate all that. And that company knew that it would, rather than just try and avoid dispute resolution, it would gain from consolidating this in a single forum. And here, Kevin's presentation was absolutely very important. So that leads me to consider in turn, and more quickly, four different types of aspects uh, for components of arbitration and see how they could be impacted. First and foremost, of course, the arbitration agreement. Well, I just said it. If we want to go that way, if some large companies or groups of companies or, or, or uh, branches of activities, sectors, economic sectors, uh, let's say, just as a matter of a joke, the uh, US oil industry, the most unlikely candidate at this stage, probably, it, it just wants to consolidate all, all, its, all its climate liabilities vis-a-vis -vis the public at large, and including, of course, the public representatives, meaning NGOs. And the, the, the whatever federation you have, and I don't want to name it here, uh, just posts an invitation to arbitrate to any member of the public who wants to bring a claim against any member of that a trade association. That's conceivable because if it's not going to happen in that context anytime soon, I would bet it might happen a little later or it might happen in less strongly uh, defensive, conservative uh, branches of activities and countries. So, uh, so in that respect, of course, uh, uh, the uh, arbitration agreement would have to be adapted. As I said, it would be unilateral, it would be a bespoke agreement, it would be uh, very much like a, a, an investment treaties uh, in, uh, offer to arbitrate. I said invitation, sorry, offer to arbitrate. I don't need to say much more at this stage, I said. The second component is arbitral tribunals. Are they supposed to change? And I keep being asked, should these institutions, the ICC, LCIA, AAA, ICDR, shouldn't they have lists of competent arbitrators in the climate change uh, um, um, uh, area? And this was highly debated in the task force. I don't, I'm not sure that the two co-chairs agreed on that. Uh, we had an example, uh, of course, which is the, uh, the PCA holds and the fact that the PCA uh, has a uh, list of specialized arbitrators. The general answer is generally given by arbitrators themselves, since one strange thing of arbitration law is that the scholars in arbitration are most often practitioners of arbitration, which of course doesn't distantiate them so much as true scientists from, from people on, on, on the battlefield. But they tend to say, no, 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 we can do it. I mean, we do we do uh, drilling arbitration, we do hydropower arbitration, we do, we do space arbitration, we do computer and, and IT's arbitration. And I've, I've probably done most of these actually myself. So I should probably go mainstream and say, no, no, generalist, uh, okay. That's what, I, what the, the position I took at the time. And I don't think the problem is here. The problem is more on the instruments that either way arbitral tribunals will have at their disposal. And I think here uh, we have, uh, let me give you a small example of something that could be a change or that could be um, developed because it exists. It's where once the evidentiary hearing is over, uh, the arbitrators would tell the party, okay, please allow us to now take your party appointed experts under our control and put them under gag orders, uh, meaning uh, they are not going to communicate with you guys, the council or the parties anymore, but only with us, the tribunal, informally to help us 
finding the right way rather than having to contemplate a, a vast number of, of issues. This is done in 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 in, in uh, uh, the uh, uh, quantitative quantitative uh, phase of construction disputes, for example. Uh, and I think this should be the, this could develop in such highly scientific and technical and prospective issues are those related to climate uh, change. Another example, I think, is that we're going to have to use uh, dispute boards much more, one way or another. We will have to have technical expertise, not only as you know, with, uh, expert witnesses, uh, expert testimony, but as participating in the process. I no, I, I have to, to 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 make things short, but to give you my ultimate dream, it would be to be sitting as an arbitrator obviously neutral, as they say in the US, uh, meaning the president in, uh, in Europe, uh, and, uh, and being appointed by everybody, my co-arbitrators and the parties as dispute board for the post-initial award development. I have cases, warranty claims, post-major uh, post and acquisition warranty claims, where parties come and tell us, we're going to need about a dozen awards over the next dozen years because we don't know how clean is clean and, and how much we'll have to dig to, to rehabilitate the, the, the site. It's going to be the same in, in climate-related disputes. So I dream of hybrid arbitration here, hybrid DB. But a DB arbitration or thing like that. I discussed it with uh, people in, in various institutions uh, and, and, and I know that there, there are toolboxes there which they want to use too. Um, the third feature and my fourth point would be should the arbitral process uh, evolve? And that's obviously a more, a more uh, important uh, uh, area. Um, and a more tangible and concrete uh, today uh, line of, uh, of questioning. Why? Because uh, I'm not the only one who believes that uh, there is a risk of uh, spillover of the uh, ISDS, the investment arbitration crisis uh, on commercial arbitration. Today we discussed commercial arbitration. The last webinar discussed investment arbitration and the ISDS. And I'm not going to recapitulate here what that crisis is, but obviously investment arbitration is very much decried throughout the world and especially in Europe. Um, European member states are, are, are just uh, terminating uh, BITs and, uh, and, and, and everything that has to do with arbitration uh, at fast uh, speed, uh, claiming that uh, it's just not good for environmental and climate and social considerations because it uh, has the effect of a regulatory chill preventing de facto countries from, for example, prohibiting tobacco or some uh, crazy uh, chemical additive into gasoline, for example. All right, uh, when I do my lecture on this at, 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 at the Sorbonne, I, uh, I have a very different approach where I put, I take every case one by one and I, I have a, a sum up and I say, okay, how many were for, how many were against? Is this criticism criticism well-founded? We don't have time to do that today. And, and we're not discussing ISDS, but the problem is that two people, and here we discuss climate, ESG. So we discuss people, the media, uh, the NGOs, two people, the politics, the politics, a lot of politics have many, many things to say about this. Of course, having absolutely no idea what it is, except that they're sure they, they do. And uh, the thing here is that uh, arbitration is just arbitration. They don't know that there's investment arbitration and commercial arbitration. Therefore, the uh, spillover risks. And here I would say I can see three developments in the ISDS reform underway that has already been implemented at ICSID in its amended rules that came into force on the 1st July, 2023, or in the UNC trial working group three. Uh, and those three trends that are relevant to climate uh, and to commercial arbitration would be the following. One, alleviate the burden of defense. A law or generalized because it's a load the early disposition of meritless claim, securities for costs, 
uh, cost a lot. That's absolutely obvious. It doesn't cost much because, in fact, it's done. It's, it, it exists in, ma in, in major commercial arbitration rules. Two, increase transparency. It's been discussed already. Uh, and I would call that, rather than transparency, I would call it passive third party involvement. You have to allow third party involvement into those types of arbitrations. Uh, and that means more transparency, less confidentiality. Where do we stop? Submissions, written submissions, memorials, expert reports, transcripts, public hearings. Where do you draw the line? Everything is possible. Everything has been done. I'm not, I'm not giving an answer. Three, improve stakeholder access. The active third party involvement. Not only the amicus curiae. Amicus curiae is, okay, it exists, it's there. It's fine. Nobody looks at it. It's 10 page maximum anyway. And, uh, and, and arbitrators, I suspect, well, I don't know. Okay. But, you know, you could have affected persons allowed to come and knock at the door of the arbitral tribunal. Look at the Swiss uh, arbitration centers, supplementary rules for corporate law disputes. They have adopted specific rules that allow shareholders named affected persons to say, hey, uh, Mr. Institution, please inform, or, or Mrs. Information, please inform me of what's going on in this case. Okay, I'm interested. Please count me in as a party. Now, that's very close from the mass arbitration slash uh, category three type of arbitrations where groups or sectors of activity would open up to uh, consolidated resolution of those specialized uh, arbitrations. So those are the three trends where investment arbitration has opened the way, gives us solutions. Look at the latest rules proposals in, in Vienna in the working group three of, uh, of UNCTRL. Uh, they're all drafted. Let's think about incorporating them in this invitation to arbitrate, or even in maybe some category one and category two, traditional contractual private disputes related to climate change or not. Some of these features may be good to take. Why? Because the public has a right to know. The public believes it has a right to know because it is climate, it is next generations, it is human rights, Etc. 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 So there may have to be allowed some dose of that everywhere. And finally, and that will be my last point, the first aspect of arbitration where changes might occur is in, in is in the uh, uh, arbitration related litigation, is in the way state courts uh, uh, intervene in, in 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 arbitration generally when they're asked to review or enforce an arbitral award. And that uh, the question here is that those questions, th those uh, areas that we are dealing here with here are very much impregnated of public policy considerations, their general interest and, and public interest. Uh, general interest because very, would it be only because very often states are involved and therefore our taxes? So that's already general interest. Public interest, because it's next generations, it's my health, it's it's my my um, my um, uh, cultures, it's uh, anything. So let me not uh, discuss the fact that uh, these might arguably not be commercial uh, disputes under uh, at, uh, Article 1-3 uh, of the New York Convention. I think that this is a, a minor uh, issue that's e easily resolved. However, the, the, the more uh, vexing question is whether international public policy, very much a French concept, I know, but we find equivalence elsewhere. Believe me, look at some, whole, some, uh, some judgments from the UK or from the US, just to look at my two co-conspirators here who have uh, little smiles here. I mean, the, the words uh, international public policy may not be pushed forward as much as they are in France by international private law professors, but it's still there. What, what am I referring to? Well, first of all, many of these problems that we have legal situations, they involve uh, governmental entities, decisions, agencies, 
rehabilitation and, and, uh, and the like. Okay, Do, those are not just lex contractus uh, 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 governed uh, issues. Of course, there's an agency. Who am I as an arbitrator to second guess that's, uh, that agency's uh, uh, decision and therefore to turn down a claim for uh, 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 compensation of the resulting uh, cost? That's it. That's the uh, the most obvious of the issues. The second one is the one of overriding mandatory rules. It is generally considered that environmental and climate uh, legislation would be what we call in French loi de police, and it's called like that in many uh, other languages. Uh, and and the last one is of course the fact that some we, we I mentioned human rights a lot now because the thing is that climate. Uh, justice is going on the uh, basis of uh, human rights more and more. And here, of course, we might get into fundamental core values that might lead an enforcing uh, a judge to uh, refuse enforcement of a, an award that would ha not have, uh, that would not be compliant with certain hyper mandatory. Uh, 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 legal rules. Now, why do I say hyper-regulatory? Because not all of them are. Uh, we're referring to the kind of uh, approaches to that we have to corruption or money laundering. But uh, not everything is that bad. And let me use a non-scientific, non-legal expression, bad. Uh, some pollution is, is, is with non-hazardous material. Some uh, um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions might not be that bad since they're allowed to be handled under uh, emission trading systems where a party can go on the market and buy some additional allowances. If it's, if it's that easy, is it very harsh international public policy regulation? There's a paradox. So this is not very clear yet. It's the beginning of, uh, in fact. But the, 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 the potential impact, and I'll, I'll close with that, is that if you end up at the end of the day with the uh, uh, rejection of the uh, of enforcement of an arbitral award somewhere, or with arbitrators being uh, prosecuted because they failed to disclose or to at least investigate uh, such a matter, that, then we're, 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 we're in trouble. So th now that's more uh, long-term perspective, but I think that those are in the uh, changes that might impact arbitration of climate change related disputes in the next few years. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I think I've touched uh, on, on too, too many things. Thanks a lot to Kevin and Patrick and Nathalie uh, for your splendid presentations. Uh, we have two uh, questions. The first from Sarah Kasmi. Uh, do you see any increase of claims involving cancellation of oil and gas exploration licenses. For example, instances of regulator or state canceling licenses and parties seeking arbitration under concession agreements. Um, I wonder uh, who, who of you would start with the answer? Would like to start. Kevin, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, uh, we've seen the Biden administration very recently uh, cancel auctions of, of oil leases in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, they had not been awarded yet, uh, but they have been restricted very severely in the in the offering of those licenses. Uh, we also had under the Obama administration cancellation of the Keystone Pipeline, uh, which uh, created a very major NAFTA dispute, um, which was then reversed by the Trump administration, but ultimately then abandoned by by the project developers. And so, yes, we see an active regulatory hand uh, in the restriction uh, of, of these types of oil and gas projects, certainly by the federal government these days in the United States. Any other comments, Nathalie or Patrick? No, I would like, I would look at Africa for the next developments in that area. I've, I've looked at uh, judgments from African uh, courts, uh, not very far from these uh, topics. And I think we will, we will see some of those. Yeah, just to, <clears throat> to add, uh, to go back, uh, this is about the uh, the I think the the 18th panel on the topic ESG. We had two major conferences on ESG and EU related supply chains, 
in February, March. They all on video, that were half day seminars. They all on video right now at the Western Partners YouTube channel. Uh, they will hopefully be transferred soon to transnational dispute management when talks with them. And all of these seminars have also been reported in the Clue Arbitration Block, and we will do the same with this webinar. So whoever is interested in these many, many topics that three panelists today mentioned, such as the Shell case, there was actually a presentation on the Shell case by the General Council of OPEC uh, and other people, and, and, and the, the matter of the tort law uh, uh notion of the duty of care as interpreted by the Net by the Dutch courts uh, actually met in September uh, at a seminar in The Hague at the conference in The Hague uh, the attorney who is handling the the the, the shell case um, so we have a wide range of topics uh, and they're all covered by webinars so let's go to the next questions Hamza Nisan Kasi to what extent should regulators and legal frameworks scrutinize and enforce ESG claims to ensure they accurately represent the company's adherence to the standards and what legal challenges may arise in this process. So who would like to, to answer that question? Oh. I'll have a stab first. Um, so I, I think we we know that regulators in certain jurisdictions are very much following um, and investigating um, actions, assertions, statements relating to adherence or not, as the case may be, to ESG assertions. And I think the most obvious sphere for that is, is greenwashing. In terms of the legal consequences, um, they are obviously jurisdiction specific, but there is quite a lot of discussion about um, what these complaints or the, these procedures can lead to. So for example, there's quite a lot of analysis on group litigation, mass claims and, and, and further regulatory sanctions, I think is also something that certainly we've we've observed. Uh, just to add uh, a thing, we, we had one of the seminars was on the UU Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive and the EU Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. And the the carefully examined all the, the obligations there there is a whole package of obligations in the annexes to those directives which are currently in discussion in the European Parliament, fairly advanced. Actually, the Council uh, modified the whole damages system to make it more European. Uh, the European tort law uh, system is a bit distinct from the Anglo-American. Uh, and that's very interesting. It's a whole uh, it's a whole set of obligations from human rights to 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 environmental obligations. Um, and and the interesting thing, it's a supply chain issue. So whatever company is going to export more than 50 million euros to the European Union market, either directly or indirectly, is will be subject to that legislation. And as I understand, Germany has already the law in place, uh, even before the, the directive has actually become into force. But that's something that will soon come up. And then, of course, you will have an enforcement issue of ESG claims through supply chains. And I'm sure uh, others will follow. As I understand, the, U the U.S. do not follow that policy, uh, but will see competing uh, regulatory uh, regimes on ESG supply chain issues where anyone who, who supplies whatever screw to a car that will then be sold to the European Union is subject to those multiple obligations. And I can tell you, it's really complex. And one of the webinars we had recently was by the General Counsel of HEAD, the sports company, about the cost of ESG obligations. It's something that should not uh, been underestimated. And we had another uh, seminar to, just to contrast this by an Austrian startup that actually sued former President Bolsonaro for ecocide at the International Criminal Court. So that just to get an idea about the wide range of the webinars we did. So uh, I don't know, if, is there anything to add to that topic from the panelists? Do you have any other comment to that? Perhaps I interrupted anybody. Okay, let's go to the last question. Diana Mala, does limitation period become an issue? during climate change disputes, especially as a defense that the acts of companies are way back in the past. Uh, please, uh, I wonder who, who would like to answer the question. 
I, I might venture a word here. I think that today the question is more to seek injunctive relief than uh, compensatory relief. And uh, public and public representatives' uh, lawsuits uh, aim at uh, having businesses change their uh, actions and their, their operations in order to decrease their climate impact more than to really pay for the past. So I don't see much uh, of that type of uh, of uh, cases now, uh, but uh, general rules of uh, limitation will apply. The question will be when do the statute of limitation start uh, running, of course. Uh, and I think we 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 will this is going to be a, a, a great uh, litigation area, but no specific clue on that. I would We're just add, uh, there are a number of tort claims pending in the United States uh, against energy companies, et cetera, for climate change disputes, also for damages, for past damages. And uh, I would imagine that the claimants are claiming both the discovery rule, which is they had no ability to discover the problem uh, and that tolls the statute of limitations. They're probably, I imagine, also claiming, uh, uh, alleging fraudulent concealment, which would also uh, toll the limitations period. So I'm not, I'm not familiar with any of these cases being dismissed to date based on limitations grounds. If I can add a word, I would say uh, good luck to arbitrators who will have to decide on statute of limitation in those cases, because you know, you when when you're an arbitrator, you don't feel like. Uh, we have a French expression, which is to say the law, the judge lays the law. I mean, we don't feel that much uh, empowered to do this as an arbitrator, I think, as as, as state courts are. And here, uh, I, I would think as an arbitrator, I would really want to rely upon state court uh, uh, case law. Uh, rather than having to set the limits myself, frankly, I wouldn't be very, very happy to have to do that. But I mean, it's part of the job. Huh? <laughs> well, thanks a lot uh, to all of you uh, for your splendid presentations. I have to uh, repeat, you know, you were part of, of, of prominent part of the ICC Arbitration AD, ADR Commission report on resolving climate change. Um, uh, and, and that's, uh, I would say, it's still the report on that topic up to now. And, and, and we are very, very honored that you took your time. Uh, you could participate in, in this webinar, uh, which will soon be reported in the Global Arbitration blog with the reference to the corresponding edited video once it comes out. Uh, and it's really an honor. Uh, um, the, the, the reason why Niva Leon and, and Western Partners started with these webinars um, was because it's the topic, it's it's something that we have to take serious, we have to react, we have to care for our children who will face uh, the problems, perhaps not our generation, but the next one, we have to do something right now. And that was what motivated us to start this webinar series. And I thank you very, very much for participating. And sorry again for the technical uh, issue we had at the beginning, I don't know what happened, but uh, we'll have the video and we had actually a very impressive participation. Thanks a lot and have a nice day uh, wherever you are right now. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you, you. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Pleasure.